Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another environmental science screencast with your teacher, Mr. Stano. Last we left off, we were talking about the damage humans have done to our marine biodiversity. Now we're going to take a look at some approaches we've had and some issues we are having with protecting that biodiversity. Uh, a number of areas like to employ marine reserves, um, which are just basically areas that are completely shut off to a number of different um, commercial interests so that these fish populations have like a refuge to go to. Uh, unfortunately, they make up an extremely small per percentage, less than 1% of the world's ocean area. So they are uh, very good methods. It's just that as a whole, they're not a very big area. We've seen fish populations doubles, um, size of growing of these organisms and reproduction triples of uh, and species diversity increasing by almost one fourth. So we, we have the documentation, we know they work. Um, some communities also work together to develop integrated plans for managing their coastal areas. Uh, and once we do that on a local level, that usually works its way upward to help develop some uh, larger legislation to protect bigger areas. We have seen studies calling for an overhaul of our ocean policy, uh, basically to develop a unified national plan to kind of put this in the hands of the federal government give the government federal more money for ocean research so we can find out what's going on because we know it's very difficult to uh, national uh, centralized national oceans agency so that we have a network uh, that one place where we can all go to set up a network of marine reserves reorient reorientate fisheries uh, management towards ecosystem function a number of states are doing this if we go to alaska we'll talk about that uh how they've basically controlled their salmon population and a number of other populations in there that they're on the they're on the rise and they're making them sustain sustainable for future generations to always have fishing there and then of course increasing public awareness letting them know what's really happening with our fisheries um there what we can do to make these more sustainable and to protect the biodiversity uh, is really one of the simplest things is regulating those fish harvest. Uh, when we look back in Canada and we've seen some of the problems with the cod industry, how because it wasn't unregulated and it completely collapses the cod industry to the point where it's not coming back anytime soon, we can see that if a little bit of management was set in place before that, yes, some people would have been unhappy, but they'd still have the jobs now. And before, now they've lost 40,000 jobs in the cod industry. So it uh, may, it's a little bit worth it to lose a little money in the back end to only make sure you have some more down the line. But fisheries are you know tough to lobby against, and they've weakened the ability of uh, many coastal communities to regulate their own fisheries. It's, it's an issue uh, that we have all around the world. And these are just some uh, issues that we see here, uh, fishing regu uh, regulations, setting catch limits. Uh, we see it all along the East Coast. I mean, really just about anywhere in the United States, we do see those catch limits employed. Uh, monitoring of fish populations to see where they're at. Economic approaches, you know. We can also uh, reduce fishing subsidies. Certify sustainable fisheries, looking at where those fish are coming on, making sure that the populations are in good standing and letting the population know or people know that where they're buying their fish is coming from an area that is expected to be thriving for a while. Uh, protect areas with those marine reserves, uh, cons uh, consumer information, letting people know. So there's a lot of solutions that we have to help out. And uh, some things that we have to worry about are like non-native invasions, killing organisms in ship ballast water. So this list right here, it's a pretty massive list, but it's pretty comprehensive. Be familiar with some of these. Uh, protecting our wetlands is uh, definitely something we need to do. Those wetlands uh, that are get transferred over for agriculture, um, you're destroying are being are destroying a number or quite a bit of habitat for organisms. Um, so we try to to stop this from happening, but it's uh, it's definitely gets harder and harder. So what can we do? Uh, protect it, legally protect existing wetlands. Make it so that um, people cannot come in and develop them. Uh, the steer development away from them, making sure that we don't have any things built up, any other tourism industries or whatever else might be around them. Uh, restore degraded wetlands, kind of build the older ones back up and just uh, prevent control invasions by non-native species. You'll see those non-native species or the invasive species keep coming back to haunt us the time and time again. If we go to Florida, we can take a look at what they're doing there to restore the Everglades. Um, what we see is a number of issues with wading birds there being completely lost. Uh, other vertebrate populations are down. 
and the volumes of water that are uh, basically once flowed through the park have now been diverted for crops and agriculture and of course for populations within cities. Uh, it's something that we hear about quite a bit and often enough around the United States. And then of course there's that runoff of uh, nitrates and phosphates causing those uh, toxic algae blooms that we also start to see here in New York now from time to time again. Uh, once again, these algae blooms are an issue for manatees and other organisms that wade or hang out in the water, and um, it also affects us too. And this is just taking a look at the Everglades area where we're looking at some of the where the areas are being treated and uh, how they're kind of embedded within those agricultural areas. Uh, other issues that we have are lakes. Lakes are pretty difficult to manage also. Uh, one thing people... Uh, accidentally and purposely sometimes introduce non-native species in it. We see it here on Long Island in a number of different lakes uh, where certain aquarium plants are introduced in lakes and have uh, really overrun the area. Uh, some other things, sea lamprey has been introduced, zebra mussel, uh, quagga mussel, and Asian carp have been introduced for any number of other uh, reasons into our freshwater systems. And uh, we're having a tough time getting these guys out. Dams. Uh, which really is a, is a fantastic uh, evolution within human history. Unfortunately, it does cause a problem for our uh, freshwater fisheries and the populations of wild salmon and these androgynous fish that move up and down these freshwater systems. Um, we try to do things such as fish ladders to go around them. We'll talk about some other methods that have been employed, especially when we talk more about dams. Uh, but it's definitely uh, an issue for those fish that come and move upstream to spawn. And... We can have some federal laws that do help us. We have the National uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, 1968, that helps protect some of these areas uh, from development. But really, it's, uh, it's an issue, especially when energy is needed. And certain practices have been employed in certain areas for a while to get that to change is kind of hard to do. So some things, the ecological sources, sorry, ecological services of rivers are uh, depositing silt that maintains deltas, the nutrients right there, purifying water, uh, renew and nourish wetlands, uh, provide habitats for wildlife, and of course deliver nutrients to sea to help sustain coastal fisheries. There's any number of things that our freshwater rivers do. And that's about it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more into some legislation that has been passed to protect our freshwater and marine systems. But that's your basic overview of what we're doing and uh, what's happening. Hope you enjoyed this screencast. Take care.